So I am, I'm going to combine uh, the story of mRNA technology development um, here um, in South Africa at the center of the WHO Medicines Patent Pool mRNA program. But I want to do that with a flavor of, of for the women, uh, the women frontiers that worked um, on this program. So I'm, I'm going to try and do it in a bit of a storytelling mode. So um, just to take us back to the fundamentals and the basics of vaccine innovation, if we look at the history over the last 40, 50 years, we all have a memory of long lead times, um, expensive and extensive studies, difficult designs. Um, and for that reason, there were many, many diseases even today, which would be pre prevented by vaccination, but for which no vaccines are available. And during the pandemic, it really pivoted, and not only for mRNA, but other platforms also in a very short period of time, able to develop and launch safe, effective vaccines for a disease and an outbreak that could have really, really upset the globe. And that sets the benchmark, we hope, for future uh, more rapid uh, vaccine development without ever compromising quality and safety. So that brings us to mRNA. So one of the platforms that made a very significant contribution to the pandemic um, in saving lives was mRNA platforms. But this was also the first time ever that this platform and this modality was able to take a product into, the, into humans and have a substantial pub public health input. Uh, uh, benefit. And I want to talk a little bit about mRNA and the history. Um, some of us may remember 1961 uh, was the discovery, discovery of the messenger RNA um, and that as one of the building blocks of life. And during a period of 60 years, extensive research has been done by, uh, by multiple disciplines to try and get this, this particular a molecule in this particular modality have a benefit in public health. And it's really, really in the last 10 years and now in the pandemic that we've seen the real benefits and the modifications that took us to a product. But a long history of exciting signs and many, many failures also. And this slide for me really, really summarizes the life cycle of mRNA and where we are today. Decades and generations Buckets full of attempts, stacks of brilliance, cups of perseverance, career risks, multiple discipline conver disciplines converging, and a pandemic for success. So in the 1980s, the lipids came, and that really, really was research that was focused on other applications, for example, adjuvants. But the lipids was part of the key uh, 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 abilities and disciplines and products that's, that made mRNA available. Failing forward, can we synthesize mRNA? Many, many failures, and only once in 2005 when it became possible. Um, and the understanding of the spike proteins and how this could be structured bring, brought us the vaccines that we have now. But in, in, law, in this long history, what, what was published very, very beautiful article in Nature Science, The Tangled History of mRNA Vaccines. Let me take the opportunity to recognize two of the, of the many women that worked um, and had critical and fundamental contributions to where we are today. And I first got to focus on Haslem Turil. Uh, who is the, the 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 wife? It's it's the it's the BioNTech founding couple um, that in in early early nineties started working on mRNA and in fact pivoted in 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 early two thousands um, and managed to raise capital from a billionaire funders uh, raised one hundred and fifty million euros as seed funding that led to the discovery of BioNTech and allowed them both this brilliant people working for 20 and more years on mRNA to in fact uh, combine their knowledge and their experience to bring uh, the BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine um, to the market and now have a rich pipeline working, working on it. Uh, uh, Dr. T Turek was, uh, is, is an immunologist. And then the second woman that I'd like to, to share a little bit of her history is a biochemist. 
by chemist Caitlin Carrico. She worked with Drew Weissman, the very, very well-known and famous Drew Weissman at the University of Pennsylvania. And she managed to produce larger uh, volumes of, of RNA. Um, and her, her focus at that time was, let's develop a vaccine for HIV. That's an unmet need, which is so profoundly uh, uh, indicated. And she started the work on HIV with Drew and the team and had a great setback when she when she administered her RNA to uh, preclinical studies and mouse studies and, and experienced a massive inflammatory reaction. And it was then the work with her and Drew Weissman that led to the use of cytouridine and the birth of modified mRNA. And that today are the two vaccines that has been on the market is as a result of modified mRNA. So there are many, many RNAs, and they're not all equal. And here, the modified self-amplifying RNA and many others. And the interesting and fascinating part is that this is still evolving. The science of RNA uh, and messenger RNA and RNA is evolving as we speak. Looking at the challenges of stability, of durability, of immune responses, of safety. And it's a fantastic science um, that is evolving that will have a profound impact, impact on public health um, as it matures. But this is, this is the history then of the mRNA COVID vaccine development. And this is particularly the, the Moderna vaccine, uh, which, which is done with in partnership with, um, with the, with the VRC. And this slide, courtesy of Barney Graham, who is one of the other really icons in the, in the discovery and the work on, on, on mRNA. So we know December 2019, who, how many of us can remember that? The first respiratory virus outbreaks, Wuhan, China, and the concern the world that this is something different. Um, and in January 6, um, the, the, the indications was that this may be COVID. Um, and January 10, the sequence were published, phenomenal in a short period of time. And then the race was on. The VRC made the, the COVID spike protein uh, within a few days, uh, uh, 20 days after the, the sequence were, were published. Uh, the first, February 1st, the first COVID spike ELISA cross reactivity studies were done and demonstrated. Uh, February solved the spike structure. Uh, by the end of February, immunogenicity studies in mice with six, within six months, the, the development of this vaccine moved to phase three trials, and within 10, 10 months, there were results of phase three trials. And in 11 months, um, there was an uh, emergency use authorization for COVID-19 vaccine. Unprecedented development of, of a vaccine and a beautiful story of how historic and deep science that existed for many years and evolved over many years came together to fast track the develop of this phenomenal vaccine. And what are the unique features of mRNA technology? The precision, highly precise, non-infectious, transient, non-mutational. It has a safety profile as an mRNA. But most important for us in this program that I want to share with you in the development of mRNA access program is the fact that this platform um, enables rapid response and is a perfect platform for pandemic situations, for pandemic preparedness, for pandemic response, but also for vaccine development. How does mRNA work? How does RNA work? Uh, without going into the deep science, I'm not a scientist, RNA scientist myself, but the mRNA is encoded with the gene of interest from the specific pathogen that you target. That's an encapsulated in the lipid nanoparticle to make it stable because RNA, one of the challenges for, R, about, for RNA is the instability. It will just cease to exist if we don't stabilize it. This nanoparticle then are injected and enters the muscular cell where the RNA is, is, is released and instructs the cell to start responding and in that way empowers the body to build um, an immune and antibodies as, as an immune response. A beautiful um, mechanism of action which is, which is um, interesting and unique to the modalities of RNA. So RNA, mRNA has many, many applications in human health. We know about cancers, vaccines, gene therapy, and this is evolving as we speak. At some point I've looked and there were over 300 candidate, both therapeutics and vaccines in development using RNA technology. 
And the applications in veterinary health, already there are companies that, uh, who, are, who are looking at utilizing the RNA platforms also to produce vaccines for veterinary use. And this is coming on into the market at, at quite a rapid rate. And then, of course, the applications in crop protection, which has been uh, spearheaded by Greenlight Biosciences in Boston, uh, another application of RNA which it brings innovation in terms of protecting crops against um, insect and pathogens. mRNA reduced the entries, the barriers to entry for vaccines. And that, the fact that the smaller footprints, the greater worker safety, the precision, um, the, 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 the development, um, the flexibility of this platform and this, this technology was the reason that in the time of the pandemic, when vaccines were not sufficiently available for the rest, for the whole world, and when again we realized that vaccine manufacturing are, are concentrated in certain regions of the world, because this is not trivial. And as I said earlier, the development cycles for vaccines are long, which has its own challenges for, for global, global access. But during the pandemic, there was a growing realization that we need due diversification of vaccine manufacturing and the capability abilities of regions to produce their own vaccines and to respond to pandemics becomes a critical issue for global health security. So mRNA and the modalities of mRNA was very suitable, that I do know, was very suitable for an mRNA program launched by the World Health Organization and partners to give equitable access to mRNA technology for low and middle income countries, a program developed and designed, which I'm going to share with you to make mRNA technology accessible, but also to build sustainable capabilities for mRNA vaccine production. So this program was launched in 2021. Within a period of 12 months, the center in South Africa, which is a consortium between African Biologics, BioVac, and the South African Medical Research Council, was created through an expression of interest um, and mandated by the World Health Organization and partners. And within 12 months, 15 partners in different areas of the world were brought into this network that will develop and receive mRNA technology as a response to the pandemic, but also in pandemic preparedness. And I want to recognize two of the visionary, dedicated, equity and access and science with a purpose women that has been part of the inception, the conceptualization, the launch and the, and the development and now the support of this, of, of, of this program. Dr. Sumia Swaminathan was the chief scientist at the WHO at the time and still a great supporter and contributor to this program. And Dr. Mari Paul Kini, who is, who is, um, the the the, direct, the chair of the Menisets Patent Board, but also the chair of the the mRNA uh, program as the chairing the steering committee, and also leading and in influencing the science of the program. Two phenomenal women that we recognise and salute in starting this program and maintaining this program. What is this about? This is about a center of technology development. We did not receive technology transfer. There was no sharing of technology, analytical methods, assays uh, from any of the, uh, of the global producers. So the program developed their own technology and we, we have, we work with developers, researchers, experts, IP holders across the globe amicably supported by Medicines Patent Pool and the World Health Organization. And this technology will then be transferred to multiple manufacturers. So it's a hub and spoke model. And here they are. If we look at this phenomenal uh, uh, network of 15 countries, 15 companies straddling four continents uh, in a network that will receive mRNA technology, will create the capacity to produce mRNA products, not only vaccines, but in time also therapeutics, and who will work together in an access model to build, improve, and share technology and sustainably focus on a pipeline of mRNA vaccines that can brought into these regions of, 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 of neglected diseases. A phenomenal uh, 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 network. 
back to African and, and our partners with which university, no technology transfer, we had to start from the lab. And this was the process that was developed um, the, uh, uh, through the product that was developed through a process of mRNA end-to-end uh, lab scale development and, uh, and scale up. And at the same time, addressing some of the challenges around the particular modalities of mRNA. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But starting here in South Africa, from antigen selection and design right through to a product now, which is in manufacturing process, analytical control uh, process, not trivial. I want to make this comment. If you People said at the beginning, mRNA is, 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 is not going to be easy. And, and law, Big Pharma cautioned us when we started. And today, here we are in scale-up, going to six liters, uh, a process that has been developed and scaled up with the analytical controls, a massive, massive amount of work with incredible technical expertise and inputs for end-to-end -end program that will be transferred to our 15 partners and here again, I want to acknowledge the dedication, the excellence and performance of um, the leader in this program, Dr. Karen Fenner. She has been part of the team that um, while the plane was flying, she was building the runway, the team, the formulation, the fuel, and the destination was empowerment. So a, a tribute to Karen Fenner, the technical director who leads, leads this program and you can see her passion as she is talking about, about the work that they've been doing. But diversity and teamwork is precious. It's never only one person. It is never only one individual. It is the support, support of teams of people, diverse teams with a common goal and supported by our leaders, as is demonstrated in these pictures. Maybe just a note from Afrigen. We are quite a female-dominated entity with 75% of our staff being female scientists, pharmacists, and engineers. And here's the results. I'm not showing you more details, but I want to demonstrate that AfriVac 2121, which is the Wuhan monovalent vaccine for COVID-19 that we have developed as a candidate that will validate the platform that is being built at Afrigen and which will be transferred to the partners. We have demonstrated now comparable safety, immunogenicity and protective efficacy to Spike Vax, our reference product. So we have a we have a product that can be used to validate the platform before it is transferred. And again, recognition to the scientists and, and the engineers that worked with us to get to this point where we have demonstrated our ability to produce a COVID-19 vaccine that is comparable to the best. MRA technology transfer, not going into the details, but an intensive program in partnership with BioVac, building the technology platform, transferring in different stages to our partners, collaboration with BioVac to go to full commercial scale. And we will now look at a COVID-19 vaccine, important for routine vaccinations to take through this process as a product for tech transfer in addition to a technology transfer to our partners. And as we were building the technology, as we are, um, were producing the product and we're doing the validations, we've already started sharing our knowledge and our IP with our partners. And 13 of our 15 partners already has been at Afrigen and received first technology packages and knowledge packages. And we are looking forward to welcome the Ukraine team in two weeks here at Afrigen. In addition to developing the platform, get the facilities ready for GMP certification, we also have, have engaged in partnerships for innovation, improved manufacturing technology, formulation research to ensure that we are optimized stability, RNA development, sharing our expertise and complementary resources to accelerate progression, disease targets, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, alternative delivery, delivery methods. Can we use microarray patches? Can we go needleless? What other technologies can we utilize to ensure that the last mile is always there and can happen uh, despite the, 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 the signs to get to that last mile. So mRNA disease and vaccines, a, a very, very crowded space, a, a busy space, a beautiful pipeline of vaccines starting to develop and moving into the clinic using mRNA technology. 
And this was the list that the partners of the 15 partners of the mRNA program has put together for neglected diseases in their regions where they would want to focus on developing vaccines for these particular diseases. And at the moment, we are putting together the programs and the, and, and the projects to address these needs. And of course, a MIC will be supported by the World Health Organization and guiding us through the probability of technical and regulatory success for these pipeline that we are looking at, but also the probability of policy development procurement so that we approach the development of the vaccine pipeline for the 15 partners in a future relevant and responsible manner to ensure that we have success at the end of the day and these vaccines can be taken up into clinics uh, and the, in the regions in which we work. I have to say something about intellectual property, a fascinating evolving field of a network of intellectual property evolving and even as we speak, uh, patents are filed, making it interesting and very challenging to ensure that what we do and how we operate, that we have freedom to operate. And here, I want to recognize the medicine patent pool for amicably supporting us to understand the landscape and to ensure that we are required, we will have voluntary licenses um, that will support this program. And again, I want to want to acknowledge the support uh, beyond beyond the science, the tech, but also the alignment of goals. Um, this is the team on brief, on budget, on time, um, and with a good deal of fun also from time to time. And let me recognize this team. And I want to make a comment about Eliana on her phone there. This is this is financial manager, always working, even when she's supposed just to rest. Um, so again, the MPP team here, so uh, the African team, um, uh, thank you for for these women who are being being supporting and contributing and keep us keep us all on track. A beautiful picture. So what is important? We have to build an end to end R and D and manufacturing ecosystem if we really want to have sustainable mRNA technology platforms and contributing. And I want to in the R and R and D speech space and in the regulatory space just recognize key key individuals in South Africa, Glenda Gray, Linda Gale Becker, uh, Tumi Samete, uh, Michelle Mulder, uh, Candace Rose from, from Northwest University, and in the right, right top corner, Kirsty Bloom, one of the key frontiers of mRNA tech development from Wits University, working with the African team, a great recognition for these women. And a comment, it's about aligned partnerships, it's about CEPI, Gavi, um, R RVMC, uh, PAVM, mRNA Hub coming together in, in a sense to, have to create end-to-end -end capabilities and an ecosystem with partnerships that will make this technology find its rightful place in public health interventions. Some closing thoughts. There's no doubt that mRNA innovation platforms will have a huge public health benefit. However, global access to these products needs to be a world priority. The barriers are lower for low middle income countries, but we still have to build the capacity, build the capability um, and drive towards sustainability um, through designs of, of and testing optimization. Success will come through genuine partnerships. Um, RNA, of course, publications beyond human vaccines. It's a true one house uh, value proposition. Recognition. This program is uh, to a village. Um, this is a, this required a village of collaboration and partnerships. And I want to recognize all of these bodies and partners and entities that worked with us towards making this program uh, impactful. And just a final slide. Um, thank you to all the men that made this program so real. Uh, I have displayed some of them here, but these are the people, that, you know, without, without our male colleagues that we would have been slightly lost. So we have really great appreciation. And there, Dr. Tetris, who has been really, really an advocate and a leader in this program, receiving his African lab coat and joining the science and the technology of this program. Thank you very much.